I'm going to mute everyone and then Diana and Yuval, if you would unmute yourselves uh, so that we don't have background noise. And Susan, if you would mute further folks as they join. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining. We're just going to wait a couple of moments um, to let other folks come in and join the conversation. So we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. But thank you so much. You're muted, Ariel. I was muted. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. We're going to be giving just a couple of minutes for further people to join. So we'll be starting in just a few minutes. And in the meantime, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and say where you're from, uh, we have folks, I believe, today joining not only from across the United States, but uh, from across the world. So love to know where everybody's from and looking forward to getting started. Gary Mann, San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> And we're going to ask folks, if you're not already muted, to make sure to mute yourselves so we don't get background noise. TJ Williams, uh, Chicago, Illinois. And I visited uh, Palestine in 2017. It was in Janine Rafa. I'm Ariel Gold of the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, for anybody who isn't familiar with the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in the world. And we formed in 1914 in Europe and 1915 in the United States to support at that time uh, conscientious objectors in World War I. And we've gone on to support conscientious objection uh, since then and have also uh, gotten heavily involved in civil rights and racial and other racial justice and other anti-war uh, work. And I am our first non-Christian and our first uh, Jewish executive director. And I feel in many ways that uh, it was beshert meant to be that uh, I would end up leading our um, historical organization in this very dark time of um, genocide in the Middle East, in, in Israel and Palestine. And our co-host today is Diana Ostrich, who is, among other things, a dear friend of mine. <laughs> Diana was a um, U.S. Army medic during the Iraq War who came to a, a realization of faith, a, a crisis moment, uh, you know, how, how we like to term those moments um, when she realized she she was called by God not to kill and um, to put down her arms and to become a conscientious objector. 
Diana is with a number of organizations, first off, Red Letter Christians, which I will let her introduce, uh, say a little bit about, and the Waging Peace podcast. She's also an author uh, the, the, of her story, and also Fellowship of Reconciliations 2020. 4th or 2026 uh, Walter Wink Fellow. Diana, let me pass it to you to introduce the organizations you're with for a moment. And I think you're muted. Welcome everyone, all the suspense because only the host can unmute. So thank you for that uh, pregnant pause there. I am Diana Ostreich and I am so honored to be here with you today. I have uh, the delight of teaming up with Red Letter Christians and Red Letter Christians just believes that the person of Jesus really meant what he said. So when he said to care for the poor, um, to object to violence and to really make the make the poor feel blessed and the peacemakers be called the children of God. So we're doing some incredible work. And one of those is just collaborating and connecting with more and more folks that we can do um, we can do more together than apart. So honored to be collaborating with Fellowship of Reconciliation and sharing some incredible um, time today with our conscientious objector, Yuval, who is calling in from Jerusalem right now. So Ariel, I'll let you do his introduction. Um, yeah. Well, I don't, something I like to do when we have guests, I don't like to give too long of an introduction because I really like that introduction to be in the conversation, getting to know somebody, but I'll just give a little bit of background on, on why we are having this conversation right now. Um, since October 7th, there have been, I believe, only three, but we'll talk to you all about that, uh, young people who have chosen to go to jail in Israel uh, when they were called uh, to be conscripted into the military. And, um, you know, that immediately touched my heart. First of all, my I have children who are 21 and 22 and I just, uh, 21, 23, I, I can't imagine them having that maturity at that age, you know, what a brave and pronounced um, decision. And so we've been wanting to lift that up, not uh, in, in, in ways of um, how does that help to transform society and build the world that we all want to live in together? And how does that um, express solidarity across religions and races and and so much and so we wanted to speak with a conscientious objector from from Israel and we were introduced to Yuval who grew up in Israel in a more traditional uh, Jewish Israeli um, nationalist experience but had a a crisis of conscience as as we call it in America, where he he just said, I, I cannot serve my country in this way. I cannot participate in this in this violence and uh, chose to go to jail. And so with that, I want to introduce you all and then, you know, get into who you are as we as we begin this conversation. I believe you're muted. Uh, we might need somebody to unmute you. If that's uh, I think you can unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Yuval. I'm 21 years old. Um, I'm originally from a small community in the south of Israel. Uh, and I have refused to go to, mil to enlist in the military about a year ago. Uh, this time last year, I was still in jail. Uh, and I have been sentenced overall to 70 days. If you if you could start, I'm immediately curious. You said Southern Israel. Is that uh, the Gaza envelope where October 7th um, or? It's not the Gaza envelope, but it's not far. Um, during the initial bombings of the northern part of the Gaza Strip, uh, the windows of my house were shaking, actually. Um, but I'm very close to the, to the wall, the separation wall. Um, 
and the Israeli side of it. Um, if you could start by telling us a little bit of your upbringing, what uh, school was like, what um, the culture in Israel and and in your area where you lived was like, and a bit about your family. Um, I come from a traditional, uh, rather well-off Ashkenazi. Um, some of you know kibbutz, then it's not too far. Um, politically, I grew up in the um, center left of, of the, the Zionist the Zionist uh, spectrum, um, and and this place is also a very militarist one, but also not in a very fascist kind of way, but in a mm-hmm. very um, It's uh, it's very subtle. It's very you know everybody's proud of it, and you do it because you have to do it, and you try to go to the best place you can go to, uh, and and that was always like what I was supposed to do. And from the age of zero, I knew I'm going to enlist. Um, during Israeli Independence Day, for example, we would uh, the army opens all its bases, um, and you can go and visit and see all the sniper rifles and the camo gear and the very cool drones. And the weapons they confiscate from uh, Palestinian militants, and uh, and yeah, we used to go to such places, uh, and uh, military museums. And yeah, my father was a tank commander. My grandpa was in the tank brigade. My uncle was in the tank brigade. So for me, I always uh, thought that I want to be a tank fighter. Um, and jumping to not so long ago, eventually that's that's where I was put. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very Zionist one, a very Zionist upbringing. Um, and yeah, you just grow up knowing you'll go to the military at a very young age already. The military is in your school, um, and then you never question that for a second. Also, historically, the narrative you que- never question it. Uh, you never question any of the wars. You never question the huge concrete strip that is 10 minutes from your house, which I later found out was the wall. Um, and you never question anything. I mean, from in elementary school, we learned the sentence, uh, it's good to die for your country. Some guy said it 100 years ago, and this is something we grew up with. We just know that it's uh, mandatory. Everybody did it in the last uh, 70 years. So if everybody gives three years of your life, uh, then you too give three years of your life. You just do it because you have to. Um, And yeah, you just also know that you grow up, you go to school and you know that whatever you choose to do in school will affect what you do in the army. So you also choose stuff that will be good for the army. And everything, including the school system, is very geared towards that. Um, if you study computer science, then you do it in order to be in the intelligence uh, forces of the army. And, uh, everything is just un- un- unquestioned. You don't question anything. Just go straight ahead. Um, and eventually, no, you'll join the army. Yuval, I think it's so interesting hearing your story of just not questioning anything that, you know, you knew everybody was going to join the military and you didn't question the stories and you definitely didn't question that it was good to die for your country because it, I had much the same experience. So for people who are raised and based in America, I feel like there's a lot of that same mindset um, that people have always served and that it is a good thing and we honor them because people die for their country and we don't ask a lot of questions. So even though currently we don't have the draft active, there's also many families where this is what everybody did. It was very much expected. Like you said, your dad was a tank driver and this is what you were gonna do. And so I think having that be your experience growing up in Israel 
is fascinating that it's a lot of the same experience here in America. At least it was in my background. I'm a third generation army veteran and only one person was drafted. My dad was drafted for Vietnam, but everybody else, like it was like they voluntarily chose this. So I think it's, I think your story helps us find the similarities because Israel seems very much over the top, but I think as Americans, how you had mentioned that it's so bound up in your identity as a citizen to support yeah. the military. So for you to find, like, how did you, because it's so much as part of your identity, how did you find your way questioning this? And how did you find the courage to choose this when you knew what your family would think? Um, so first of all, I would like to add another point, which I forgot to mention. And I think that's a very, very unique thing to Israeli society is how militaristic it is um, and how the military is important in the society and how just prevalent it is. Guns everywhere um, is very big and scary guns. and. You're very used to driving in a bus where there is an M16 barrel pointing at your head. Um, so that's also a very um, major thing. But as far as uh, when things started to change for me, um, I've always had uh, I've been rather an individualist child. Um, so also in my like when I began high school, I started. Um, developing more and more uh, my political identity. Uh, but it developed without any relation to Israel-Palestine. Um, started developing some anarchistic tendencies. And, uh, and, and then at some point, I really don't remember how or through what, I, I encountered um, just pictures, images, and videos uh, from the West Bank, not through major media channels, but just through independent um, photojournalists and uh, collectives as such that do this. Um, and I have all of a sudden realized that there is another reality, another completely different reality existing. 20 minute drive for me. Um, and it's not just a different reality. It's a reality that, that contradicts the one I've grown up with. Um, I, I knew all these things. I knew that the IDF does only what it does and I only what it needs to do. And I knew it's the most moral army in the world. Um, but then I see these pictures which very clearly prove that it does things that it really shouldn't do um, and that surely are not moral. And uh, it, it was also at a time that's when I received my draft letter and the, the army is, is considered an apolitical being in Israel. It's above politics. You you don't touch it. Even no matter how much political turmoil, um, you do not touch the military. That's because that's it. That is the the base of Israel. Without it, there won't be Israel. So you don't touch the army. And soldiers are not to are not allowed to speak about politics. Although, for me, it's very obvious to say now that the army in itself, every army, is inherently political. Um. But I was one of the very, very lucky few who managed to get politicized by my draft letter. Um, and once I got it, I realized that I shouldn't just go blindly. Um, so these were these three elements, my like just my political kind of starting to develop a political identity starting to get more and more ex exposed to the Palestinian reality and my draft process going on. It was these three things that kind of pushed the, the change and moved the change in me. Um, and, and as far as the military, I, I got to a pretty like advanced stages in drafting. I, I wanted to enlist, so 
but at a very early stage, I realized that um, I, I should be careful to wear a mist. So I had like, let's say two very concrete directions, um, which I also got a lot into the tests of and got to pretty advanced stages again. Uh, military paramedic, I thought that I'd be saving lives and uh, see like a naval officer because there are no Palestinians, Palestinians at sea, so I wouldn't have nothing to do with them. Um, and honestly, <laughs> I don't know what had happened if I were accepted into these roles. Luckily, I didn't get accepted. Um, and and yeah, so I I like. I had this shift in me during my time, and then it got to a point where I said, okay, I want to go to the army, but it's just not specific goals. It's like whole things I don't want to do with. So I decided that I will selectively refuse, which means uh, I'll just go to the draft officer and tell him I'm not willing to be in the West Bank. I'm not willing to carry arms. I'm not willing to deal with the civilian population. Put me wherever you see fit. Um, and then I kind of went along with this for a while. This was all like during high school. Um, and then I just realized that I'm not at all comfortable with the idea of enlisting. Um, and I realized that I'm just making excuses for myself. Yeah. Um, and that I should just not go to the army. Um, because it in itself is inherently problematic and inherently oppressive and holds this apartheid system and does not promise security, but rather is just a big policing force. Um, and, and yeah, I realized that I'm in this political crossroads, um, which I'm, uh, I'm either going to join the army and be a part of Israeli society and be complicit in all of this, or I'm going to say no and just, yeah, stand for what I thought was right and what I do that I think was right. Um, I didn't um, want to publicly refuse necessarily at the beginning. Um, I just wanted, no, I just knew I didn't want to go to the army. So first, firstly, I reached out to, after I decided I'm not going, uh, I've reached out to an organization called New Profile. Um, and they deal with uh, helping people lower their uh, physical profile, which is the stat the army gives you that uh, says, like, what's your health situation? And, and they let, help you get out. So with them, I went through a process of, something called a conscientious committee, which is a committee that exempts maybe like 10 people a year for conscientious reasons. Um, and you appear before them and they exempt you only if you claim pacifism. Um, and this pacifism needs to be apolitical because the army is not political. Um, so if you say, you have any empathy for Palestinians or you disagree with apartheid policy or disagree with the occupation, you won't get exempted. Just have to show that you're disgusted and appalled by any kind of violence. And it's to a point where they ask you, they ask uh, women especially, like, if you were raped, um, what would you do? Because you would not hit your uh, rapist, obviously, because you're a pacifist. So that's the kind of discourse that's going on there. Um, I went to them. We fought for 45 minutes. Um, I didn't convince them I'm a pacifist, and I didn't get the exemption. Um, and at that point, I'm I'm a part of a, an organization called Mesavot, and we are the basically the, the only organization in Israel right now dealing with military refusal and representing military refusers and supporting them. Um, and, and at that point, after after uh, not getting exempted, 
for those reasons, I reached out to myself both and uh, decided I'm going to make a statement out of it, especially because of those times that it was just when uh, it was declared that Ben Gvir, the ultra-fascist uh, settler, is going to be in the government. Um, so it kind of pushed me to, yeah, reach out to myself both and with them um, refuse publicly and uh, loudly. Wow, I, I have so many, so many thoughts. Uh, I, I've just been doing this kind of deep dive into pacifism, actually, because that's Fellowship of Reconciliation's roots. And um, some of our most prominent pacifists, A.J. Musty, who um, was probably one of the most brilliant uh, political minds uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, peace movement. And, uh, you know, and I was just like having this kind of debate internally on I I identify as a pacifist, but for me, a pacifist doesn't is isn't about whether I get raped. And I I might hit back. That's an instinct. It's not the personal, but it is the political. It's this abhorrence to war, and it's this belief that the ends don't justify the means, and that how do we create a better world, and that we can't do that by using the tools of oppression. And um, so uh, to hear that, and I'd heard that before about conscientious objection and in. in in uh in Israel, but to to hear that and but I wanted to ask um so I, I have family in in Israel and uh, uh I, I recall very well when between my uh children's bar and bat mitzvahs I, I brought them with me and we spent three and a half weeks traveling throughout the West Bank staying with Palestinian families and and we did spend some time we went to um, a family reunion and um you know, what stunned me so much were two things. One that um, my Israeli relatives had barely ever like met a Palestinian and had, you know, there's just no knowledge of. And so when I would describe like these friendships I had with, with folks in the West Bank, they, you know, it was this complete disbelief. And um, they said, no, you know, you're wrong. You cannot have like nonviolent friends there. They, they must have machine guns hidden under the house. Um, so I wanted to, I'm curious, like your interactions with uh, Palestinians growing up and, and knowledge about um, what was going on across, you know, just half an hour away. Yep. And, and, and um, just to clarify. That. Yes, please. Um, just to clarify, I'm seeing like part of the chat. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. Neither is Ms. Salvot. We do not claim this. Um, as an organization, but uh, yeah, my trip, like none basically. Um, until I seeked it actively, I I knew of Palestinians. Um, I didn't know any, because in Israel there is also this concept of a good Arab, bad Arab, uh, because of course there are many many Palestinians in a forty eight in sovereign Israel, um, but. Israeli consciousness does not consider them as Palestinians. For a lot of people, Palestinian is a Muslim from the West Bank or Gaza. Um, people in Israel are, are Arabs, and and they're not the same. It's not the same thing. Um, so you also grow up thinking this. So in that sense, you've also never met a Palestinian. Um, because also some of them do not uh, describe themselves as Palestinian. But uh, yeah, until I seek that out actively, um, I have never met any Palestinians. And also, it was some time into my activism, because I was not an activist before I refused. And only during my refusal, I became an activist. And so it's not only until I became an activist, it's like until I started actively going to the West Bank and seeking these relations or East Jerusalem, I have not um, met and had a chance to talk with any Palestinians. Uh, and I true and after meeting them, of course, you meet these. Of course, it's a whole different range of people, but the ones I met were very nice, very pleasant. Accepting my Israeliness and not minding it because I'm there to help them and stand in solidarity with them. Um, but I, I feel that uh, this subject especially is 
very, very important to speak about, uh, especially in relation to Gaza, because Gaza, until now and also during the war, until the war and during the war, Gaza has been a blind, the biggest blind spot um, in Israeli society. Um, because Israelis believe that the occupation in Gaza ended in, in 2005 after Israel pulled out of it, although it uh, it just became much more elaborate in many different ways, many other different ways. Um, but yeah, there's this huge, huge disconnection between us and the people there, but then you see activists, activists from the left in Israel, who have contacts there and who have friends there. Um, and then and you really see that human relations triumph borders and nationalities and all these dichotomy, dichotomies and things that we learn to accept as inherent and so natural, but are actually totally manufactured by states and leaders and yeah. I really think that one of the powerful ways that your story right now, I think across the globe, it's not a question of pacifism. I think it's a question of conscience. And will we have the courage to have a conscience to determine what we believe and then stand against it, even if it's our own government, even if it's our friends or it's our family, even if um it's it's for us and i think that having your story and the other israeli conscience rejector is leading the way calling to account all of us of like will we have a conscience and then will we stand up to violence and say it's not okay and i know that very few people and very few faiths have a history of this it is there but Presently and culturally, we don't even question violence the way that we don't question the stories right. we've been told. And so I really love that when you stand up publicly and share your story, I feel like it is bringing us all to account and also giving us a, a way to ask ourselves, are we going to stand up against this violence, even if it costs us? Because I think that as long as we don't we don't confront that, we we can stand on the sidelines, we can have opinions, we can read some more books. But right now, this question of refusing to accept the violence that we see in Gaza is polarizing people. And for some, we don't really understand why that's so hard to be against violence. So what would you say is most helpful? when you're trying to ask people to refuse to accept what they're seeing happening in Gaza? Um, at, at least for me, what led me to questioning my manufactured reality was uh, that I started becoming an anarchist, but without getting into that, the, the main thing in it for me was realizing that people just want to live and that life is above everything. It's above states, it's above borders, it's above peoples. Um, no, there are many, many Jews and Israelis that are way less connected and related to than many Palestinians. It's These are all constructs. And I think that it touches some very deep emotions because, again, people don't know each other. Um, and one of the biggest things in this regard in Israeli society is how just crazy the dehumanization, is, the dehumanization of Palestinian goes. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't think that Israeli media really truly values or acknowledges Palestinian lives, which is something terrible to say, but that's the case that I feel. Um, 
and and uh, yeah, and I think for me, at least talking to my friends and all of that, uh, the biggest and more, most important thing is that all these dead people are dead people. And no, even the worst terrorist was committed a suicide bombing in, uh, in like, and killed civilians and did a terrible act. It must, it must have come from somewhere. Um, without it, without justifying what it did, just people experience pain and all people experience pain and our target is not should not be to keep a country safe it should be to minimize pain and let people live rightfully so for me the biggest thing i try to do is just create these comparisons and say well they have families their people they're sad i mean that we the fact that they killed a thousand something people from us does not let us take their lives. I mean, because eventually we're just all humans and we all, all of us feel pain and, and nobody, I don't believe that anybody does what he does out of true evilness or, or whatever. So yeah. Talk with people I think that's one of my most my, my biggest point is just that yeah we are all just people in war it doesn't serve any of us and and if 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 killing more than 30,000 Palestinians is what the state of Israel needs to survive then we should question <laughs> we should question if if, if it's if it's right, we should question if, if the state of Israel, I mean, because human life is above all. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. That human life is above all. I feel like that is really powerful for people to reckon with because that's our future. If we don't choose that, there isn't really a future where we all get to stay alive. Yeah. Could you tell us, uh, just first, if you could give us a little background on, because it's very different than I think conscientious subjection is done or refusal to serve um, in, in the United States um, and, and other places, what that process looks like, the, the periods that you go uh, to jail, when the releases are, how long uh, conscientious objectors serve there on average, a little background on that, and then um, what that experience was like for you? Um, yeah, so it starts all the way from your draft. Um, and then it's like a two year process until you enlist. And a lot of conscientious friends, conscientious projector friends knew from from ever since they got the draft that they're not going to enlist. So they didn't um, push for any process with the military. I did want to enlist, so I did. Um, but yeah, then your uh, draft day comes. And you show up to the, uh, the to the base where uh, where you get enlisted, and there is this uh, process called the Sano chain of becoming a soldier, and then there they give you your military ID and give you uniform and give you vaccines and all of that. Um, and before going in, uh, before becoming a soldier, that's where you refuse. Um, and then you saw this process of them trying to convince you and telling them, okay, let's give you another job or something. First time I refused, they offered me to become a uh, stable boy for the police, uh, cleaning uh, horse manure um, instead of holding a gun. Um, of course, I refused that kind of offer as well. Um, 
and yeah, they try to negotiate with you, and you, of course, know that you're not joining the army, so um, it's not a very, yeah, nothing happens there, and then uh, they send you to the jail in the base, you spend from a few hours to two days there and uh, until you get sentenced. And you get sentenced for refusal of an order, which is not a very severe crime. So you can get either between seven to uh, 45 days in prison for that. Um, and then you get sentenced and you get sent to prison. And how it works essentially is after every time you finish this short sentence, you get another draft letter. You get released, and then when you when you get released, still in prison, they give you a letter and they say you need to enlist in twenty four hours. Um, so it goes just again and again and again and again until somebody breaks. Um, there has yet to been a refuser who joined the army <laughs> during his refusal process. Um, so for me, it was like 10 days in the beginning, and then I just got a few more sentences until it all ended up to 70 days, and I was eventually released. Um, now, we in Mesavot uh, represent four military refusers. The one that has refused first, uh, his name is Tal. Um, he, to this point, has been sentenced to... I believe, I'm not sure if uh, 150 or 170 days. Um, and his, and the first time he was sentenced was, his first uh, sentencing was to 30 days. Mine was to 10. So it's now when there is a war, um, they're much, much harsher with it. Um, and we also have yet to have a refuser who has been uh, exempted during this war. So we wait and see how it goes. Could you tell us about Tal? He signed a letter along with a hundred, it said a hundred other young Israelis who were, who said they were refusing to serve. Can you tell us a little bit about that letter? I'm not sure which letter you're referring to. Well, there has been I, think, a few. I think it was like a hundred college. I mean, they were 18 because like you said you get drafted out of high school but I think Tal and then Sophia all signed it with 100 and they said that they were refusing to join the military until there's a democracy in Israel for both sets of people. It was during the anti-government protests. Yeah so this uh, letter was uh, before the war it was during the anti-government uh, protests and the um... There are maybe a way to mute the. Okay, um, yeah, I just muted the comments. It's uh, distracting. Um, so it was during the anti-government protests, and it has not been a hundred. It was actually two hundred and fifty, I think. Wow. Um, which was <laughs> the biggest refusal letter signed, I think, since two thousand and five or something. Um, yeah, but again, it was before the war and, uh, Tal decided he's going to refuse before the war and also Sophia. So they both, uh, both, uh, signed on it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that there is a new, there is like, so people were protesting before, but with the war, do you feel like that is allowing more young Israelis like yourself to question their political identity or to question the military? That's a, uh, a tough question with a sad answer. Um, people always have mixed emotions about stuff like this. Um, it happened during every war, most uh, prominent during the first Lebanon war. Where, where there was the biggest anti-war uh, movement because it's kind of like our Vietnam. Um, but refusing is the active act of not going to the military for political reasons. 
Um, and we have not seen a major increase in that. Um, th there are many people who did not join the war in, in the military prison right now. It's in the at the highest capacity it has been in, in the last years for sure. Um, but, but it's hard to say for how many of the people there um, the, the political cause is a very is, is a major one. Um, I can only say that we in Mesavot currently uh, represent four refusers, um, which are people who have not joined the war because they resisted on political grounds, and that's the main reason for not joining the war. And they also want to make a statement out of it. I know that there are many, many more who found find who have found other ways to leave the military also because they don't believe it's unjust, because they believe the war is unjust. Um but yeah, so the the most solid statistics we have is just people who is who have been with us in Misavot. And uh we have not seen a major increase of people joining us, I think. Um, we we peaked uh, during the counter-government demonstrations before the war. So not Palestine-related, but internal politics-related is when it was more popular there? Uh, yeah, it's sad, but yeah. Um, because also it's, it's much easier going against your government while staying inside the Israeli discourse, um, but, but resisting the military in support of Palestinians is, is kind of leaving this, and that's a harder thing to do. So, yeah, not, not, uh, yeah, there is, there isn't, there hasn't been, uh, very major increase in people that are with us. That's that's what we can say for sure. It's a it's a hard thing to go against one's culture, and 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 I know this uh, myself as as an American Jew. And when I really took on working on the issue of Palestine and being maligned in my synagogue and getting death threats and um, being deported when I was deported from Israel, being cut out of part of my family and um and much much more um but i imagine that that kind of backlash that i faced which felt and still feels very very severe and significant for me in the us um i can't imagine that it compares to what uh israelis who do this this political work experience and and i wonder what that's like um and if and including like is it well known uh who you are or is it more under the radar um whereas a lot of the backlash i got was because i'm very public um about it um the biggest thing is the alienation you feel uh because all of your friends are in the army, it's what everybody in your community has done, and everything is around it. So, so the main thing is, I'd say, the alienation. Um, we have received personal attacks, um, but but not anything like too major. Um, but for example, yeah, Tal just. I was speaking to him as a friend, and he said that uh, already when he went, when he goes, every time he goes to the military base to refuse, people there recognize him. Um, but yeah, it's a very, very unpopular opinion. People don't let us in. To, I mean, we we just can't get into schools, no matter how we try. I'm um, just to voice this side as well. Um. I mean, mainly our Instagram comments are like traitors and 
of this, of course. Uh, but but for me, again, I also refused at a time when it was much, much easier to refuse uh, because a lot, because the govern the government wasn't favorable on many, many people. So my act of refusal got sympathy also from uh, the center left, the Zionist center left. Um, so it, it's hard for me to speak about refusal now, but then it was much easier for sure. But for me, the main experience is just the alienation, being an anti-militarist person inside a very, inside maybe the most militaristic society. Diana, did you? or I'm happy to go otherwise. All right, I'm gonna jump in. And and I got really excited when I heard you say that there are four people. So I'm wondering if uh, I'm aware of Tal and Sophia and Ben, if uh, somebody else has done so, and if you could tell us a bit about them and uh, best ways, because I've been trying to follow myself and, and I really want to keep up with any news about um, the current conscientious objectors, or I believe you call yourselves refuseniks as well. And uh, when somebody's uh, out for a bit or just a a any updates and what are the best ways um, to to follow along on social media and what uh, to sign up to get um, updates from, what organizations to sign up to get updates from in English um, for us. Um. So I, I can't really el elaborate on the fourth because he's anonymous and also I uh, don't know him uh, personally. Um, yeah, every, every other per person that refuses, it's exciting. Um, and as far as following us, uh, maybe you should send the link. We have a link tree. Um, just look up myself vote, how it's. M E R S A R V O T. Um, you can sign up to our newsletter there. Um, you can donate to us, and you can follow us on. Uh, we have Instagram, we have uh, Facebook, we have Twitter, and and that's the the best place to get uh, updates. Yeah. You're muted. Is Messer vote the same as Israeli Solidarity Network? Is that the English? Is that as Refuser Solidarity Network? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Refuser Solidarity Network. Or are they distinct? No, they are different organizations. Uh, we are part of the same broader umbrella and we work closely. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's not the same organization, no. You're also welcome to sign up to their newsletter, um, but they're touching on wider subjects. Yeah. Okay, and you wanna jump in? And I, folks, I put uh, uh, one of the links, I believe this one is to their Instagram, and I see somebody else put the link tree uh, event in the chat. So um, please do that. Thank you for sharing with us because sure. you mentioned it multiple times about how part of your story was, you knew you didn't really want to be in the army, but you would just kind of figure out a way to do it, you know, and then you came to yeah. this point where you knew that you wanted to refuse and then to refuse publicly. And I feel like that is the part that Martin Luther King, when we were doing civil rights, he caught the conscience of the nation. Like he knew that he had to publicly show what was wrong so that the masses would the country would notice and their consciences would be pricked and so i feel like yeah. as you keep continuing doing this you are being the person that is showing us that if you can have a conscience and you can go against your your country <laughs> and even your culture of what you were taught then the rest of us can also choose to have a conscience and to choose to object 
I think that is that is the big two things that I think conscientious subjector is like hard for me to even pronounce. I've been stumbling on it all week, but having a conscience and choosing to object when you know that human life is not being honored, it is not being made the yeah. main thing. I think that is that's one of the greatest powerful things that and the courage that you give us by doing it publicly refusing. Thank you. So thank you for that. We're going to continue to highlight your voice because I think it is contagious when people start to have a conscience and hopefully more and more um, people will join you and yeah. it will be less and less lonely for you as you lead yeah. us. Yeah, so Thanks I want to uh, just begin a little bit, actually before we move into some questions uh, from our audience and, and a couple of folks that we want to um, invite to, to come on camera to ask them. But first I wanted to ask your reflections on this current moment um and mm -hmm. you know we i i spend all my day from beginning to end you know trying to follow news in the ways that i can trying to um trying to follow israeli media some because i always like to know what the narrative is there and then al jazeera and and so on but i know that it's always different from from within and mm -hmm. uh, but one thing i i heard uh i think yesterday or so was that um some some suggestion that uh, there's an expectation of this war going on for months or years, and if, yeah, if you could give your thoughts on this moment, um, where it's going, and I know that's a very very broad question, but uh... if there's one thing I've learned through these uh, two three years of uh, being an activist is not to expect anything. Uh, again, we were peaking before the 7th, and then the 7th happened, and things change all the time, um, very, very frequently. Right now, the direction that I feel we are going in is just Israel being shunned from the West um, through boycotts, hopefully, eventually, through, through sanctions as well. Um, and yeah, more and more recognition of a Palestinian state. Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. I mean, because I feel that also when one moment, um, the Israeli government can decide that, uh, no, it's, it's too big of a risk at this point, and, and then it'll, I don't know stop the war and uh yeah it's, it's it's really really hard for me to say but the the international direction for me at least is, is a hopeful one uh yeah i'm looking at europe i'm looking at the us and seeing the the popular uprising of people uh, also refusing to be complicit uh, it's also a form of refusal um it's very first of all inspiring and also seems to start pushing things in a, what I feel is a good direction. Um, so I, I want to ask a question from uh, Alexi Tsuni, hopefully I pronounced that okay, from the European Bureau of Conscientious Objectors. And then, and then afterwards, I want to invite my my friend Yuri. Yuri, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because it will be a shame to come on <laughs> camera. Yuri is in uh, Ukraine and is a, a pacifist and conscientious objector there. But uh, Alexia is asking um, about if there's any, I know there's a bit on the far left, like plus 972, but if there's any Israeli media that reports on the conscientious objector, if it reaches any type of mainstream media. Um, actually, we are much more popular on, on, on right-wing uh, Israeli channels than we are in any central one. Um, yeah, of course, not favorable reportings. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have very close relations with 972 and the Israeli branch, Sihama uh, Komit, local conversation. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, especially, I think in the last year we've had uh, a lot of like Israeli media as well, um, especially, I don't know, like live discussions and panels and stuff like that. Um, we also had a prime time item like more than a year ago, but uh, nothing that uh, of course not not you know only challenging us and uh, never truly listening, I'd say, and also yeah, and I think that like really follows just uh, what's your stance on this, and we've had an instance, um. <laughs> Few months back, Talin Sophia. No, I'm not sure if it's Talin Sophia. Uh, Talin, yeah, Talin Sophia. I think were uh, broadcasted live in some afternoon news uh, broadcast, and they've asked them something like the about the war, like why did you refuse the war or something like that, and they said. Well, because of, of the occupation, they said we wanted to. Yeah, they said we wanted to refuse even before the war broke out, because there was an occupation, and they just cut them off and said, "Oh, okay, thank you. We didn't come here to hear this. Then just like shut it off." Um, so that's the. I think that's the spirit of uh, mainstream things. Yeah, you're uh, muted again. So I'm going to invite uh, Yuri on to unmute and um, please to, to ask your question. Welcome, Yuri. Nice to see you. And we will need you to unmute, Mary. Yuri. Please unmute. Uh, ask to unmute. Uh, you might not be able to join at this point. We will. Uh, uh, we can... Hello. <laughs> greetings. Hello uh, uh, greetings from Kiev. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, so, so wonderful to uh, hear you, you all, and uh, solidarity. You. Uh, solidarity uh, and support from Kiev. Uh, here in Ukraine, uh, we uh, understand. Uh, in part what people feel uh, in Gaza during this genocidal war because uh, unfortunately uh, bombs uh, are too harassing us here and uh, uh, you know uh, 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 you told you're not a pacifist uh, uh, and I respect, of course, uh, your views, but you know, uh, I think that pacifism uh, is uh, uh, important part of diversity of thoughts in democratic society, and uh, pacifism gives people a hope for a better world uh, without wars. Uh, I uh, personally came to Israeli embassy here in Kiev uh, to uh, deliver a message uh, that Israel uh, should comply uh, with order of International Court of Justice. And uh, also, Israel must comply uh, with uh, uh, recommendations of uh, Human Rights Committee uh, of United Nations regarding uh, uh, so Israel should stop in, uh, imprisoning conscientious objectors. And uh, uh, this uh, is common problem uh, in Israel and in Ukraine, because in Ukraine too, the conscientious objectors uh, uh, are uh, uh, being imprisoned now. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, you, uh, uh, how do you think we could uh, uh, transform our societies and our legal systems uh, to uh, make uh, 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 our states, uh, our governments more compliant uh, with human rights standards? Uh, maybe we need to, to educate people more uh, 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 on nonviolent resistance, because, of course, pacifism uh, is nonviolent resistance to all sorts of war and aggression. Uh, and I think uh, uh, even people who are not pacifists understand that not only uh, uh, some force methods, uh, but love and truth uh, is a greater force. Uh, 
uh, um, Ukrainian philosopher Grigory Skavorada uh, once wrote uh, 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 a dialogue in which uh, one of uh, uh, a person said, uh, 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 I am not a soldier, uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, my uh, profession is to know uh, civil laws. Uh, so uh, 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 maybe we need uh, to help judges to understand better uh, that uh, and uh, uh, judges, lawyers, prosecutors, uh, uh, all of them understand better that uh, there could be uh, nonviolent methods uh, to protect uh, 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 rights uh, uh, of people to uh, um, uh, achieve self-defense, uh, 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 to uh, achieve justice without violence, as uh, Martin Luther King said. How, how do you think, uh, uh, how we, we could uh, uh, transform our societies? Thank you. Um, I can speak, of course, uh, about my society, about the Israeli one. Um, and because we have a lot of dogmas that are very common and and I, for us we we of course always talk about the Palestinian side but also a very important talking point for us is the the, the relation of the army to our society um, because a very, very common concept in Israel is the concept of security. And we claim, for example, that the army does not bring security because the, the sad reality is that a lot of people, when, when they feel, when they really feel victims, um, don't have a place in their heart for Palestinians. Um, so we, we try to reach out and say, hey, this is harming you as well. And since the beginning of this war, for example, um, we talked about the point that the army has killed more Israeli hostages in Gaza than it managed to rescue. Um, and that, of course, violence only breeds more violence because all of these kids that have been displaced and massacred and like what will they grow up to be um so for us it's really talking like th there was this research that was published by some institute not far not long after the war started and it, and it showed that the the worst tactic for talking to israelis about the war is trying to uh, sympathize with palestinians this is Sympathizing with the Palestinians is the thing that, like, brought up most like disagreements and and anger, uh, because people really are in their own pain. So, yeah, for us, it's just trying to speak to the Israeli heart of like, this does not help you. You know, we we are now, and and I support this, but Israel now is at risk of again, being shut off from the Western world. More soldiers keep on dying. We push and push any peace with Palestinians away because, I mean, it's, it's not trivial that somebody would want to do peace with um, the state that committed genocide to them. So, yeah, just sometimes it's being pragmatic and, and speaking to the to the heart of your own people and like just saying like yeah this does not help you um, that's at least one of our tactics um and we're going to bring alexia on from european conscientious objection bureau if i had that correct um but first yeah you you got me so much thinking on on that and um if you could talk a little bit about before and during and now kind of the dehumanization of Palestinians. I know you said the, that um, there's this idea of separating um, Palestinian citizens of Israel and, you know, referring to them as Arabs or the good Arab or the bad Arab, but West Bank and Gaza. And have there been times, I guess, when 
uh, there was more humanization where when Palestinians were less dehumanized and are there any strategies for, um, cause we were talking just about like this moment of ending this war, but any like long-term strategies for, um, helping Jewish Israelis to recognize the humanity of, of Palestinians, or as I would say, the humanity of, of all people, uh, but in this case specifically. And then Alexia, I'm going to bring you on. Um, I think that this, I think that this dehumanization thing is a very much plan, a planned project uh, by the Israeli state ever since it was founded. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I believe it goes way, way back. But dealing with it, it's just, for me, it's like trying to bring my friends to the West Bank. Um, there are many initiatives that fly Israelis and Palestinians together for like a week in some European country or many programs that um, just try to make Israelis and Palestinians meet and talk. Um, a lot of times these projects just fail to acknowledge uh, power imbalances um, and, and treat Palestinians and Israelis in that space as equals, which is obviously not the case. So a lot of times it doesn't work. But yeah, on my part, it's just trying to drag friends and come meet this guy and come meet this guy. And yeah, just really on, on that level. And also, for example, in uh, like our demonstrations, like the left demonstrations in Jerusalem, for example, what we have been doing now for months is just holding pictures of people killed by Israeli bombs in Gaza with their names and their age. And just, yeah, trying to let the faces speak for themselves. So also a lot of, a big part of like the, the radical left activism is, is this trying to humanize the people on the other side. And yeah, just hoping it'll act as some wake up call for Israel. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. We have a, a question from uh, Janine. Um, She's speaking of a near total blackout of media um, coverage of of the Palestinian uh, narrative on this. And if you could give us um, an idea of the propaganda campaigns taking place or Hasbara, as they as as <laughs> Israel calls it there and um how that affects uh, mindset and including, I, I want to just add into that what we've just seen in the last, you know, just right recently with the banning of Al Jazeera and uh, then even initially going after Associated Press uh, for their camera that was facing into Israel. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you could talk a bit about that. We we feel like in the US we have media blackouts and I know it's, it's in propaganda and I know it doesn't hold a, a candle. Um, so much, I think that much more than active, it's passive propaganda, which just means not showing, um, pictures and images from Gaza. Uh, there have been some horrible pictures, which I definitely regret seeing. Um, but to reach them, you need to dig deep into independent Palestinian media. Um, but also, we've seen it a lot with, for sure there have been sexual assaults committed by Hamas on the 7th. I don't doubt this at all. But Israel really, really weaponized this. Um, and there are a lot of things which were later found out as wrong, and also the beheaded babies um, Hamas did stuff that was bad enough. It didn't need to behead babies to do some bad stuff. Um, but yeah, this was eventually discovered to be just a false 
uh, claim that was spread on purpose by the Israeli state. So it's also these like individual uh, facts um, and also just the, the keeping people blind, um, be it through what is happening now or be it like what led to the situation. Um, people don't realize there was a siege on Gaza. People don't know that more than 80% of the population there were poor, that there was no drinking water, that people went through operations without anesthesia. Um, it has been a terrible place. And if you know it, then you can understand why people in such such a bad situation would do such an extreme act. But this was totally hidden away from the Israeli eye. Um, so I'd say that Israeli propaganda is, is much more a passive one than an active one. Um, it's much more just looking the other way and also this kind of like double speak stuff of just yeah like what a terrorist means in Hebrew um, a terrorist is a, Pal a Palestinian who has been killed by the army um, it's not somebody who attacked civilian population um, in our talks uh, soldiers can be murdered a soldier cannot be murdered uh, because he is a soldier so it's all, it's all kind of this stuff for, I don't know, the, the IDF is the most small army in the world. Why? Never have I ever once heard an explanation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just passive, like looking the other way and hiding stuff and also just how our language and culture is structured around it. And changing of historical narratives also, obviously. Yeah, Diana, if you could uh, speak to this a little bit, because this is also, you know, your your story in that way. I'm just really honored to hear your story, Yuval. And, you know, there's no, there. the similarity is that people are so the same across all time, how we're just taught to dehumanize somebody else, but very passively because actively might make us feel bad <laughs> about our own stuff. And so I, as a conscientious objector, I didn't even know what that was until I was in middle of the preemptive strike in the Iraq war. But I think the same thing, what was very true is that um, as an American, I was just taught that there were two buckets of people there were the good guys, which was us, and then there was everybody else. And so if we were the good guys in every war and in every conflict and just like yeah. existing, then I was taught not to notice the person at the other end of my gun or my policies, and I just didn't notice them. I didn't have to question whether they were bad guys or not, or what did they do? or anything. It was just, well, if I'm the good guy, which I was told I was, and that feels good to me, then everybody else is just the bad guy. And when yeah. that changed, when I really saw the person at the other end of my weapon in the middle of the Iraq war, I was like, oh my gosh, we are both just really scared and we both really want to stay alive. And I'm pretty sure that our governments really don't care that much about either one of us. You know, like we were yeah. thrown in these places and told to see each other as the problem. And I feel like that was the transformative thing for me was when I refused to see myself as the only person who had goodness, who had value, who had worth. And when I chose to humanize, that meant that nobody was collateral damage. Like yeah. I could right. take what I wanted and people just had to suffer for it. And I think that that is the thread that I hope we are going to, th we're, we're going to ask people to look at that because 
I was in Iraq in 2003 in the invasion, big bombing. And after I came home from war, after over a year, the next time I had ever had an M16 shoved in my face, like I had in war, was when I was in the West Bank going through a checkpoint. And I was on this, you know, touristy bus. And all of a sudden, this sweet, young 18 year old is walking on the bus and shoves an M16 in my face. And as a combat soldier, I was like, ooh, like everything told me that this was a war zone. And there were they were waging war there even though my Christian narrative had told me that Israel was this mythical, beautiful place where it was God's country and everything good was there. Um, that just disintegrated. And I knew that this, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And everything yeah. there you, you knew was wrong in your soul. So I feel like just continuing to refuse to dehumanize each other is how we reclaim our agency. And I remember Ariel was on my podcast and she had said this line that stuck for me. She was like, we just want our right not to kill, which in America, we talk a lot about our right to kill, not a right not to kill. And I was like, yes, I think we need to start choosing that or fighting for that, that we're not going to dehumanize each other. We're gonna choose each other. Um, and I know there's many, many conscientious objectors on this call, and I'm grateful for you. Um, and there's a lot of conscientious objectors from veterans from Vietnam because there's a draft. I'm from the Iraq War. There's not a draft. So a lot of the elderly vets for peace are like, where's your generation, Diana? I was like, well, it wasn't so bad for us. In fact, <laughs> for for many people, it was financially good for them, and it gave them um, some valor in society and you know that's seen as something that they are always honored for so i'm just grateful that we can bring conscientious objection uh to the conflict in gaza and to our um our humanity because that's what i hope yeah. my sons have. that's what i hope that they get to see us creating and i know we are over the hour mark so we are definitely going to wrap this up um, but thank you so much to everybody who is here. You've all, thank you for publicly. Thank you for having me. Publicly being a refuser and sharing your story with us. Thanks. I'm going to invite Alexia on real quick first, and then we'll um, bring Susan Smith on for a moment, just to thank everybody who has supported this, um, this event. Uh, Alexia, please. Thank you for I also want to thank you so much, uh, the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the, the Letter Christians for organizing all this interesting event. And uh, I'm also grateful to you, Yuval, and to Messervot. I was with you both in uh, November and in February, and I joined you in your actions. And I'm really, really inspired by what you are doing there with this great personal cost. And uh, this is at the point where I wanted to ask and to focus of the solidarity and the international solidarity especially. If you feel, if you are aware of what is happening all over the world, especially for the refugees, for the consensus objectors, and uh, you said already, and we shared also in the chat, uh, funding is very important, raising awareness is important. Uh, please just tell us more ways that we could support you because uh, you are really now the the focus of our efforts during this uh, time as well as of course we never forget the war in ukraine and our russian ukrainians and belarusian objectors uh, but uh, okay genocide is only happening in gaza so you you are also being uh, considered the traitors in your own country so we understand your very difficult uh, situation so please tell us more ways that we could support you and uh, many, many thanks again uh, for uh, for and the Red Letter Christians for this. Um, again, you're more than welcome to donate to us. Um, but uh, yeah, amplify, just amplify your voice. I think it's very valuable that people know that there are not only Jews, but Israelis who refuse this, who disagree with this, who feel that it does not represent them, who want to see another future. 
Um, and then we totally feel international support uh, and we are very grateful for it. Um, but yeah, I think that amplifying voices also obviously of Palestinians is, is always uh, a very good way to help. Thank you. So I'm going to bring on my dear friend and colleague, Susan Smith, uh, to, uh, we got a lot of support for this event and want to give some thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, we want to thank our many co-sponsors uh, from all over the world uh, for this event. Uh, first of all, um, Rabbis for Ceasefire and uh, Africa for Palestine. Um, also, we have uh, Band Killer Drones and the uh, Churches for Middle East Peace, Code Pink, Community Peacemaker Teams, um, and Muriel is on the call today, um, Connection EV uh, from Europe, um, Conscientious Canada, uh, Conscientious Objection Watch uh, Turkey, um, Uh, European Bureau uh, of Conscientious Objectors, and we we just heard from Alexia. Um, we have International Fellowship of uh, Reconciliation, uh, Christian Renew with us, and of course, uh, I4 is FOR USA's um, umbrella organization. Uh, let's see, um, we have uh, Pax Christi, uh, Freedom Road, Hindus for Ceasefire, Faith Strategies, LLC, um, Jewish, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, Middle East Crisis Response. We have both Mennonite Action, uh, and Adam is with us for Mennonite Action, and um, uh, Mennonite uh, Central Committee. And we have um, uh, Phil, I saw Phil is with us today, and Candace. Uh, Pax Christi, New Jersey. Um, Abigail is here, and uh, actually, she's Pax Christi UN. And Kathy O'Leary is with us. Um, of course, Red Letter Christians. Uh, Diana, our co-host, um, and Shane Claiborne, who actually was zooming in when he could um, from from the West Bank. Um, Veterans for Peace, uh, the Ukrainian pacifist movement. Thank you so much, Yuri, for joining us from Kiev. Uh, we have Olga Kartach from um, Our House, which is, uh, uh, she's from Belarus and in exile in Lithuania. And we're so thrilled that you could join us today, Olga. Uh, World Beyond War, uh, David uh, Hartzog uh, joined us today. Um, Rockland for Palestine, um, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, Northern New Jersey, Jewish Voice for Peace, Westchester, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing anyone, but uh, uh, some some folks. But uh, that that is the uh, the bulk of the list. Thank you so much, and especially thank you to Yuval for uh, sure. joining thank us. You for I, I put again the link in the chat, but I don't actually see a donate button on the link tree. Um, uh, there is a big. Uh, like let a, me. It's a it's a big like the circle at the picture. top. Is it, oh, it's on the picture. Support us. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to put that exact link in the chat. Uh, page, and then we are also going to uh, send out, um, we're going to send out the video to everybody. And we're going to send that link again, encouraging folks to donate um, and uh, how to follow Red Letter Christians and Waging Peace, which is Diana's podcast and book and story and Fellowship of Reconciliation and much more. And um, Yuval, we, we thank you for your, for your work. and. Sure. Thank you. And um, when you speak to Tal and Sophia and Ben and, and all the conscientious objectors, past and current um, in Israel, if you would give them our, our deepest solidarity sure. love. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.